Thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate the song service. Appreciate each and every one of you participating. Always is an uplifting experience to have the opportunity to sing these praises unto God. Roland, I'm supposed to have something. Ah, thank you, sir. Between me and this machine, it never works but about a fifth of the time, and I know that that's all my fault. And all, but I, I'm a learning a little bit every now and then. Appreciate these guys in the sound room working with me and encouraging me. We've been looking all year at this, at Paul's advice to different congregations. We finished last month the book of Second Thessalonians and we noticed that there were two problems that he dealt with more than any other and that was how to deal with trouble in our life and also with a false teaching in relationship to the second coming of Christ. When you come to the book of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus, I, I really believe that you could just sum it up in one word and that is gospel. Uh, he is going to advise the church to, and Timothy and Titus especially in relationship to the uh, importance of maintaining sound doctrine. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, that's what Christ said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's Paul, Romans 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power, uh, it's the power unto salvation. You know, it's it's truth. It is John eight and verse thirty two. It is John seventeen and verse seventeen. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Uh, when we get away from the word of God, is when our problems are going to begin. I want you to start with me in First Timothy chapter one, beginning in verse one. I want to read the first five verses. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now notice verses 3, 4, and 5 in particular. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. He gets right to the heart of the matter. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a warning is what he's saying. I'm trying to help you, Timothy. Uh, you need to stay here and maintain the purity of the truth. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions Rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Listen very carefully. Now, the end of the commandment is charity. Now, what's the purpose of writing these things in relationship to commandments, gospel, truth, word, whatever you want to call it? What's the purpose in these things? Well, he says the goal is to achieve love. What's the goal here at Adamsville? What should be our goal as a Christian? Look at John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. A lot of times we have a tendency to... Um, Major in minors and minors in majors. We get hung up on little bitty nothings that mean absolutely nothing. And we want to bite and devour and destroy. And it's got to be our way or somebody's got to hit the road. Is that not true? And you look at the church today. And, and you see the splintering. And the division that's there. Instead of what Paul said, here's the whole point. Love. Love. When we look at our lives, can we honestly say that we're doing exactly what Paul said? 
when he was speaking to the church at Corinth and he said, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth it not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. And endureth all things. When the world looks in at us. Do they see a group of people that love each other? Or do they see a group of individuals that at best tolerate each other? There's a big difference between those two. A big difference between those two. We're going to look today at the importance of the end of the commandment. Uh, if you look at some of these other translations, there uh, I have about 25 or 30 up here this morning. I'm not going to read them all. Let me just read you a couple because I think it says it may be better where it says the goal of this command is love. That's what it is. This is the entire goal. Uh, the New Living Translation says, The purpose of my instructions is that all believers would be filled with love. Is that what we're after? Is that our purpose? Is that our goal? The English Standard Version says, The aim of our, cho our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The Berean Study Bible says the goal of our instruction is love. The New American Standard. But the goal of our instruction is love. You kind of get the idea? Here's what Paul is hoping Timothy will take from this conversation. Take this from this letter. Our goal is, is not to... Beat individuals over the head with the truth. You know, I, I, I told, told my adult class this morning that I was teaching that I, I never was very good at going to debates because debates just infuriate me. They make me want to pick up a stick and hit the fellow in the head and say, why can't you see the truth? Why are you lying about my God? Why would you teach that about that passage? And there's no way that it says that. You know better than that. You're not honest. So I have to kind of stay away from them. But what I want you to take away from this lesson this morning is this. If you don't learn anything else, learn this point. If we take love, if we take love out of Christianity, it is to destroy Christianity. And if we forget that, brethren, then we're not going to achieve what God would have us to achieve. I think, first of all, we can look at the fact that this is hung up, Roland, and you're going to have to advance the slide. I told you it wouldn't last long. I think there's two things you can see from this passage this morning. There are obstructions. You know, I, I put a road up there to kind of symbolize the fact that we're traveling. And at the end of the road, you saw love. And that's the goal. That's, our, that's where we're headed for. But Paul warns Timothy that there are some obstructions. First of all, he says, don't teach another doctrine. There are other doctrines out here that are not what Christ taught. It's not what the Holy Spirit wants taught. This is not the first time Paul has warned churches. You go back to Galatians chapter 1 beginning of verse 6. 
And he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any, any other gospel in you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. What doctrine do we teach? I think I was reading uh, somewhere this morning. Uh, I, yeah, I know exactly where it was. It was in uh, Piloting the Strait uh, by Brother Miller, where Didache is used around 30 different times in the New Testament. And that simply means teachings. And in regards to those 30 different times, it's used as the Word of God, it's used as truth, it's used as gospel, it's used as teaching, and it goes on and on and on in sites the way it is translated from the Greek into the English to convey to us the message that we should receive. When you're talking about the gospel, you're talking about truth. You're talking about the Word, the Word of God. Nothing more and nothing less. We have to be careful that others don't slip doctrines in in relationship to what they believe or what they want to practice. Because some people are not interested in the truth. They're interested in promoting the idea that they want. Take your Bibles and look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9. Hebrews 13 and verse 9. I want you to notice what the Hebrew writer says. Be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited to them that they have been occupied therein. Notice that little phrase, not with meats. What in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, if you'll tie in Romans chapter 14 and the chapter in 1 Corinthians where Paul is speaking about meats idled, uh, uh, offered unto idol and the eating of these meats, which, listen to me, means absolutely nothing. Is there anything wrong with eating a hamburger? I hope not because I like them. I like them. The point that Paul is trying to make is there's nothing in meat that is inherently wrong. Now, the only time that we need to be concerned about this is if we may be causing somebody to stumble, to lose their faith. And that was in re reference to meats I offered unto idols. He said the best thing to, to do is eat the meat and don't ask any questions. That way your conscience won't be bothered anyway. When you look at these doctrines that slip in, and surely there were doctrines in the New Testament church that were being taught that destroyed the body of Christ, not the eating of meats. Take your Bibles and go back to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, the Spirit expresses that in the latter times some... And this is important, shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What were two of the doctrines that they were teaching? Verse 3, number 1, forbidding to marry. Is it wrong to marry? Absolutely not. Can you think of a prevalent denomination in our society today that teaches it's better not to marry? Especially, it's wrong for the priests to marry? Hmm. Paul seemed to have a little insight to this years before this doctrine was ever going to come up. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. You've heard me talk about this passage before. I remember growing up as a boy right here in Adamsville, Alabama, going to the little bitty school that's not much left anymore, headed down towards Shady Grove. 
Uh, and every Friday, you know what we ate? Fish sticks and french fries. I used to like fish sticks and french fries, so it didn't bother me. But I had no clue as to why it had to be fish sticks until somebody enlightened me one day. It's because this large denomination believes it's wrong to eat meat on Friday. Therefore, you've got to eat fish sticks. Well, the insertion of doctrines that are wrong is nothing new. Paul is warning Timothy right here. You need, there are things that will cause you to get, they're roadblocks. They'll keep you from reaching the goal of love. What is that? Well, one of them is teaching other doctrines. Why do you think there are so many splinters and fractions in the body of Christ today? Because some folks throw up roadblocks. You can't eat in a church building. You got to put a little doily on top of your head if you're going to walk in here. Uh, I just, Made, made mention of, of this in my adult class this morning. Uh, I was preaching somewhere a month ago, and an older gentleman came up to me afterwards and said, You wear jewelry? Oh, I knew where he was going with that when he started off. I said, Well, I've got a wedding ring on. You know that's wrong. That's sinful. I said, I, No, I really don't know that. What, what passage would you use to prove that? And, of course, the passage that he's talking about, it's not really talking about the jewelry per se. It's talking about how we perceive it and how we look at it. It's talking about a, a violation of Matthew 6 and verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. There's a lot of folks that don't put God first in their life. Some folks, it would be wrong with their jewelry because they're putting it first. It'd be wrong for some of us in regards to, mm, I hate to say this, even Alabama and Auburn football. Because we might put that first. It might be wrong in relationship to hunting and fishing because we might put that first. Anything that we put in front of God is wrong. It's wrong. So we need to be careful because these, these type of teachings will cause divisions. Now the second thing he says in regards to these obstructions, he says, you need to be watch out for these fables. These, these stories, these uh, laws that you might create, man-made, is what they are. I, I equate it to a passage that you find back in Mark chapter 7, beginning in about uh, verse 6. Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, you know, I, I could create a religion and establish anything that I want to do. And, and, and we could call it religion, and we could be sincere about it, and we could be devoted to it, and, and, and we could do anything and ever question, what's the basis What's the standard in relationship to what you do? Well, I created this. It's not the Word of God. Wrong basis. Wrong standard. Notice what he says. How be it in vain. That type of worship is vain. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of, for, of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things so do. Now, we can create any kind of story that we want to create, but that does not mean it's going to save us. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, but refuse profane and old wives' fables. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4, and they turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Titus chapter 1 and verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables. So there's all kind of fables, traditions, man-made laws, but they're not right. 
They're not the power of God. And, and that's, not, that's not what we need to bring into the body of Christ. That's not going to bring unity. It's going to destroy the unity of Christ. Uh, you know, not to get too personal, but how many times have you been in an adult classroom setting and, and you know old brother so-and-so or old sister so-and-so that has their pet peeve? And it doesn't matter if you're talking about creation. Well, that, that reminds me of, of this, and, and, uh, and that reminds me of, of Proverbs 22 and verse 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he not part from it. And if you don't have that verse, then you don't have any of them. You know? It, you, they're going to make a fable even out of the Word of God if they're not careful. Because they make it teach what they want it to teach. They give more importance to that passage than they do any scripture. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 still says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's all God breathed. I can't point at one and say this one's more important than that one. We have to use them together to obtain what? Well, according to Paul to Timothy... The end of this commandment, the goal, the purpose of this instruction is love. Love. That's what it is. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 at the end of this lesson. And we'll see Paul said once again, that's the end, the goal of these commandments. The third thing he says, endless genealogies. I, you know, you could spend a lot of time... Uh, dealing with this, but let me point one passage out to you this morning. From Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, here are the Pharisees and the scribes, and again, they're in confrontation with Jesus Christ, and he says, O generations of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from this wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham our father. You know, you, you think in our day and age we'd be way beyond that. Met a, a young man just a, within the last two weeks. And he has a background in, um, well, uh, let's just put it this way. He has a religious background that's very different from ours. And he said, you know, they tell me that I can trace my ancestor all the way back to the priesthood in Egypt. My statement to him was, well, you're going to have a hard time proving any of that because all of the records were destroyed in A.D. 70 in the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Oh, no, no, no. Oral history has it that they slipped those records out of Jerusalem and carried them to Egypt. And that's why, that's why the Romans had to follow them down into Egypt. I said, you're going to have a hard time proving that. You know, what he's, you know, genealogies. That's what he's talking about. Look at me. I'm something. I'm somebody. I am a Christian because... No, you're not. You're not a Christian because of your mama and daddy. Not just simply because of who they are. Your mother and daddy may have taught you. And they may have taught you properly. But just because W.E. Hayes was my daddy doesn't mean that Ronnie Hayes is a Christian. That is a choice that you and I have to make when we pick up this book and, to st and study it and make application to our life. Now, I don't think Paul was trying to tell Timothy that these are all of the obstructions. These are the roadblocks. These are the only roadblocks that you're going to find in your life. And I don't believe that. But I think he's warning him there are roadblocks. The next thing that you're going to look at, he kind of switches gears. He goes from obstructions to the fact that 
and I quit reading in verse 5, if you noticed. He says, the end, the goal, the purpose of the commandment or these instructions is love out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, and faith unfeigned. Those are the three points you need to look at. How am I going to be able to reach my goal? Well, I can reach my goal this way. First of all, it comes from a pure heart. Again, in Matthew, or excuse me, 1 Timothy 5 and over in, in uh, verse 22, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Don't you love Matthew 5 and verse 8? Among the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart. Why? For they shall see God. When you look at Solomon and David over in Psalms um, 24 and verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Paul speaking to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, when he talks about virtue and praise, uh, purity, if he says these are the things that we need to dwell on or think on. These are the things that help us obtain the goal that we're trying to reach. Our hearts can't stay uh, surrounded by sin. Our hearts cannot live in that situation and not be persuaded away from the goal of love. What's our motive in relationship to our Christianity? A pure heart. Then he talks about a good conscience. When you look in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, and herein do I exercise myself and have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men? I think that gives you a definition of what a good conscience is. Void of offense toward God and toward men. When you look at the life of Paul, uh, over in Acts chapter 23, I believe it's verse 1, where he said, you know, I've done... All of these things that I've done, I've done them with this good conscience, a clear conscience. What had he done? Well, he had persecuted uh, uh, Christians. He had tried to stamp out Christianity because that's what he thought God wanted him to do. That's why he could say, I have lived in all good conscience toward God until this day. Now, let me tell you something about your conscience. Your conscience is only as good as it's trained. Now let that sink in. It's only as good as you're trained. If you can train a child, take a child and train it that, that you can go into this store and you can steal and steal and steal, and it's okay. Because people have pushed you down, you're downtrodden and you're less fortunate, therefore it gives you the right to steal. If you can train that conscience that way, they can steal and walk out there and if you say something to them, they're almost offended. Why? Because it's been trained improperly. A good conscience is going to come when it's trained with the Word of God. It understands righteousness. It understands justice. It understands truth. And it makes application thereof. And then in the last place, it talks about faith unfeigned. Here is faith that's not hypocritical. How in the world can our faith be hypocritical? Well, I think John summed it up in 1 John 3 and verse 18 where he said, My little children... Let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Oh, I'm not supposed to tell somebody I love them? Or I'm not supposed to show them? Well, the point of the passage is, but in deed and in truth. It takes all of it. 
We can't just say, I love you. You can't say, be warmed and be filled and then not give them anything to put on their back to warm them or put anything in their belly, belly to fill them up. That doesn't help them. That, that's hypocrisy. As children of God, our lives are not supposed to be lives of hypocrisy. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 down in verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. Now, Paul was using himself as an example. And in regards to that, he said, you can look at my life and see that my words and my life are in harmony. In chapter 2, look at verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the spirit of God, speak we in Christ. I remember when I was at Memphis School of Preaching, one of the things Brother Hearn used to say to us was, fellas, there's a lot of times that, that uh, preachers' lives ruin their opportunity to be faithful and good and useful in God's kingdom. He said there's a lot of preachers that don't never need to get in the pulpit, and he said there's a lot of preachers that don't ever need to get out of the pulpit. And the whole point was, is... Is your life destroying what you're teaching or is your teaching destroying? Is there a conflict? Is there hypocrisy? That's not what we, that's not what we represent, or at least that's not what we should represent. I want to close, as I said, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, we read... Four, five, six, seven a while ago. But I want to start in verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part... But then shall I know even as I am known. Now abide faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. Paul said the purpose of my instruction is love. I ask you this morning as a child of God. Have you reached that goal? Have you reached that purpose in your life that the you can see the love at the end of the road and that's what you're striving for? Now don't answer yes too quick. Because you might find yourself caught in a matter of hypocrisy if you say, oh yeah, that's, that, that's exactly what I'm shooting for. Well, then there's a lot of things you need to consider. Do you put God first in your life? Matthew 6 and verse 33. Uh, don't allow things to hinder you from worshiping your God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, not forsaking the assembling as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you worship God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Do you live, Matthew 5 and verse 16, where your light is shining every day? Or do you on occasion become ashamed? Paul said, I'm not ashamed, Romans 1 and verse 16. But do we become ashamed and put our candle under that bushel so it doesn't give light? No. It's our responsibility to let that light shine. What's your goal? The goal is love. If you're here and you've never been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you want that goal as your goal in your life, then start the journey. 
Start the journey on that road. How do you do it? It's through hearing God's word, Romans 10 and 17. Believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When you see that in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Confessing his glorious name. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. When we repent of our sins, Luke 13 and 3. And then we're buried with him in baptism. Acts 22 and verse 16. What's the goal of your life? If you need to change directions, now's the time to do it. If you need to respond, won't you come as together we stand and sing?